Welcome to part two of our video series on residual stress. In this section, we will be discussing the measurement of residual stress in a component with a focus on the X-ray diffraction method. If you haven't seen our introduction to residual stress, we invite you to watch that video first so that you'll be sure to understand all the concepts discussed in this video. How does residual stress affect a component? We know that residual stress can affect a component in many different ways, including its fatigue life, resistance to corrosion, distortion effects, and dimensional stability. So how do we quantify and monitor these issues within a part? Residual stress can be measured at different depths in a component, and the specific issues you're investigating will determine the depth at which you need to measure. For example, if you want to investigate fatigue life or corrosion resistance, surface and near surface stresses are more important to measure. This is the stress with a depth of up to one to two millimeters. For issues like distortion and dimensional stability, measuring the stresses deeper inside the component, also known as bulk stresses, would likely be more helpful. Many methods can be used to investigate residual stress. However, some methods, like ultrasonic, Barkhausen, and eddy current, only provide qualitative results. Others, like neutron diffraction and sectioning, cannot measure surface residual stress, which is very important for analyzing safety issues like fatigue life. While hole drilling can measure at the surface, it is a destructive method of residual stress measurement and cannot quantify high stress levels. X-ray diffraction is non-destructive and can measure any stress level accurately. It provides quantitative data at the surface and near the surface, allowing you to investigate critical residual stress issues. What is X-ray diffraction? X-ray diffraction involves an X-ray beam hitting a sample and creating a constructive interference pattern from the X-rays scattered by the atoms in the crystal sample. Depending on the type of sample, different diffraction patterns will be produced. A single crystal will produce a diffraction pattern with spots. A polycrystalline material will produce a diffraction pattern with rings because of the random orientation of the polycrystals. Before we dive into more X-ray diffraction theory, let's quickly discuss what X-rays are. X-rays are high-energy electromagnetic waves with a length comparable to the distance between atoms in solids, about 1 angstrom, or 10 to the negative 10 meters. They are produced by the collision of fast-moving electrons with the target material. Unlike visible light, X-rays are invisible to the human eye. When an X-ray wave interacts with individual atoms, it can be absorbed by the electrons and cause the electrons to oscillate or wiggle. This oscillation acts as a new emission source and emits an X-ray of the same energy as the incident X-ray. This is known as Thomson scattering. All of the individual sources of scatter will then constructively and destructively interfere with each other, creating a diffraction pattern. In order for diffraction to occur, there must be constructive interference. So what is the difference between constructive and destructive wave interference? When X-ray waves interact, they sum together to create either amplified waves or suppressed waves. The type of interference that occurs depends on the phase of the X-rays, whether the wave peaks line up with each other or not. When the wave peaks line up with each other, we get constructive interference. When the peaks do not line up with each other, we get destructive interference. The basis for X-ray diffraction is a combination of scattering and constructive interference. In a crystal, an equation known as Bragg's Law allows you to determine the interplanar distances, or d-spacings, in a crystal from the angles at which constructive interference occurs in a diffraction pattern. Bragg's Law is represented with the following equation n lambda equals 2d sine theta, where n is an integer multiple of the wavelength, lambda is the wavelength of the x-ray, d is the distance between planes in the crystal, and theta is the angle where constructive interference occurs. 
HKL planes refer to the crystallographic planes within a crystal. These planes can be identified by using the Miller indexing system, where an HKL plane is described by the following. H equals 1 over the x-intercept, K equals 1 over the y-intercept, and L equals 1 over the z-intercept. For example, in a cube, the 100 refers to a plane that intersects the x-axis. This is equivalent to one of the faces of the cube. The 110 refers to a plane that is diagonal inside the cube. Each HKL describes a family of parallel planes with interplanar distance d. This d-spacing determines where a peak will occur in a diffraction pattern. With a diffraction pattern, we can get a lot of valuable information about materials. The crystal structure, the crystalline phases present, clues to the chemical structure, preferred crystal orientations or texture, and other structural parameters such as grain size, crystallinity, stress and strain, and crystal defects. The peak position is determined by the dimensions of the crystal, specifically the interplanar distances. The peak intensity is determined by the structural chemistry of the crystal, or where the atoms are located within the crystal. The peak shape is determined by the size of the grains and crystal imperfections. Now that we've discussed X-ray diffraction and its ability to measure the D-spacing in a crystal, it is important to understand the effects of stress on D-spacings. When there is tensile stress present, D-spacing increases and the diffraction peak shifts to a lower angle. When there is compressive stress present, D-spacing decreases and the diffraction peak shifts to a higher angle. Polycrystalline materials, such as metals, are made up of grains or individual crystallites that are oriented in different directions. Stresses in the material will cause the D-spacings oriented in the direction of the stress to be affected more than those at an angle. Measuring D-spacings using X-ray diffraction allows us to determine the stresses present in a sample. First, we measure the Bragg angles of diffracting planes over a range of orientations by scanning psi, which is the angle between the sample surface and the diffracting plane. Then, the Bragg angles are used to calculate the D-spacings. The measured D-spacings are plotted against the sine squared psi values. From this plot, the normal stress, sigma 1,1, and shear stress, sigma 1,3, can be calculated. The full stress tensor can be determined by performing two additional measurements. First, we can measure the sample at 90 degrees relative to the original measurement to get the normal stress sigma 22 and the shear stress sigma 23. Then, we can measure at 45 degrees to the original measurement to calculate the shear stress sigma 12. The third normal stress sigma 33 is equal to zero since the measurement is at the surface. This technique is known as the sine squared psi measurement technique. It is used to calculate stress because it provides the most reliable data possible. This technique is compliant with all stress standards, including ASTM E915 and ASTM E2860. It is time-tested and highly accurate. It provides triaxial stress information, giving you the full stress tensor, and it provides directional information. Since X-ray diffraction is a surface technique, the X-ray beam can penetrate about 5 to 20 microns into the sample, depending on the material. However, sometimes we might need information about the residual stress at greater depths in the material. In this case, we can remove layers of the sample by electropolishing, allowing for the creation of stress versus depth profiles. There are several advantages of using X-ray diffraction to measure residual stress. It is fast, with most measurements taking two to five minutes. It is very accurate, typically plus or minus 10 megapascals. Results have a high spatial resolution, typically 0.5 millimeters or better. Experiments can be repeated because they are non-destructive, meaning that we can measure the same parts and locations before, during, and after service. And it can be a portable method, allowing for use in the lab or in the field. We hope you enjoyed our video on residual stress measurement and x-ray diffraction. Thanks for watching.